are very important in poetry because they provide the first impression for your reader as they approach your work. And changing a title can enhance or significantly alter the overall meaning of your poem. So most of this video is going to be about titles of individual poems, but let's start by talking about titles of collections. The importance of a title is really, really evident when we talk about poetry collections because a good title could be the thing that makes you pull a collection off the shelf in a sea of other options. Some collection titles that I really like are You and Three Others Are Approaching a Lake by Anna Moshe Vakis, The Soluble Hour by Hilary Gravendick, Electric Arches by Eve Ewing, I'm Alive, It Hurts, I Love It by Jennifer Espinoza, Museum of Accidents by Rachel Zucker, Otherhood by Reginald Shepard, and American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin by Terence Hayes, a collection in which every single poem has the same title, which is the title of the collection. So obviously Terence Hayes put a lot of thought into that title. In my opinion, all of Heather Crystal's collections have really good titles. Heliopause, The Trees, The Trees, The Difficult Farm, What is Amazing. Heliopause is just a really interesting word. It means the boundary of the heliosphere. It's not something you hear every day. And the other collection titles, I would argue, tell you a little bit about what the poet's skills might very well be, like The Trees, The Trees. Sounds really nice, and it's also repetition, so you think maybe this poet is good at repetition. In The Difficult Farm, difficult is a really interesting and unusual adjective to use to describe farm. I don't think I've ever heard anyone <laughs> call a farm difficult, so that makes me think, hey, maybe she uses interesting adjectives and word choices in general. And what is amazing is unusual syntax. I mentioned in my interview with Topaz Winters, which you should go watch, that I originally found her work because I was intrigued by the title A Portrait of My Body as a Crime I'm Still Committing. And I picked up a collection of Sappho's poetry without knowing who she even was, which is embarrassing. Shouldn't admit that on my YouTube channel. But I picked it up because the editors had decided to title it If Not Winter, which is just a really, really unusual, strange, bizarre logic for a sentence. So hopefully I've adequately demonstrated the importance of a poetry collections title, but you probably already agree that that's important. But titles of single poems play a similar role. It's the hook. It's what gets you interested. If, for example, you're flipping through a literary magazine, you might be more inclined to read a poem if it has an interesting title. But titles do a lot more than that. They essentially set up the expectations in order for you to either meet those reader expectations or break them, hopefully, in an interesting way. The title also gives you an idea of the tone of the poem, how you're meant to read it. So a meditation on XYZ is going to be different than an ode to XYZ, which is going to be different from a portrait of XYZ. A meditation we expect to be contemplative, an ode should probably be laudatory, whereas a portrait is pretty neutral. Those are expectations anyway, but of course, you as the poet can very well subvert those expectations in the body of your poem. For some examples of that, we're going to be reading some Jennifer Espinoza poetry. I've talked about her before. I love her. This is from a collection called There Should Be Flowers, and this poem is called Comfort. Comfort. 11 a.m. Time to wake up. Muscles sore, jaw clenched, warm light scattering dreams of violence across the bedroom. I've chosen a self too large for this body, too willing to change for others, too beautiful to appear in public. I'd tell you to walk in my feet, but they're all I have left. I've been weathered down to the ankles by all the news reports, all the listening, all the not doing. When I crawl out of bed, I don't know where to go, what to say. I tried to talk about comfort, but how do you describe a color you've never been allowed to see? Titles tell you what a poem or a novel or a short story is supposedly about. And this poem is about comfort but really it's about discomfort. To me, this poem is a lot better and more interesting and more impactful than it would have been if it had been called discomfort. We wouldn't have gotten any nice surprise out of the body of the poem. I also wanna point out that the end of this poem harkens back to the title. I tried to talk about comfort, but how do you describe a color you've never been allowed to see? That's a really effective technique, bringing things full circle either to the title or to the first few lines. It's very effective, it's just very satisfying. It seems to fit. Let's talk about another Jennifer Espinosa poem. This one's called A Guide to Reading Trans Literature. A Guide to Reading Trans Literature. We're dying and we're really sad. Okay, I don't even need to keep reading. I mean, I could, but I'll read a little bit more of that stanza. We're dying and we're really sad. We keep dying because trans women are supposed to die. This is sad. Okay. To me, there's a, an immense achievement in this poem, which is that I think 
I think, bear with me, it's funny, okay? It's obviously not funny that these things are happening, but it's funny because of the subversion of expectations, right? A guide to reading trans literature sounds serious. It sounds academic. It sounds like, oh, here, cis person, I wrote you a guide to experiencing and reading trans literature. And then you get to the first line and it says, we're dying and we're really sad. Like, you probably don't need a guide, <laughs> right? And it, it is, it's kind of making fun of the kind of person who would feel like they need a guide to trans literature when it says, we keep dying because trans women are supposed to die. This is sad, okay? You shouldn't need to be told that it's sad. You shouldn't really need to be told any of this. And I feel like a lot of that humor comes through the subversion of expectations between the tone of the title and the tone of the poem. This has been yet another advertisement for There Should Be Flowers and Jennifer Espinosa's work. Go buy it. Another technique worth mentioning is that in poetry, the title can essentially function as the first line of the poem if you want to break that line up and have part of it be the title. And Paige Lewis does this a lot in her collection, Space Struck. So here's an example. This is called Because the Color is Half the Taste. Because the color is half the taste, it's a shame to eat blackberries in the dark. But that's exactly what I'm up to when a man startles down the street screaming, the fourth dimension is not time. He makes me feel stupid and it's hard to sleep knowing so little about everything. So I enroll in a night class where I learn the universe is an arrow without end. And it asks only one question, how dare you? I recited in bed, how dare you? How dare you? But still, I can't find sleep. So I go out where winter is and roll around in the snow until a sharp rock meets the vulnerable plush of my belly, a little blood. Hunched over, I must look like I'm hiding something I don't want to share. And I suppose that's true. The sharp, the warm wet, the color is half the pain. Why would anyone else want to see? How dare they? Once again, the final lines harken back to the title. Because the color is half the taste, the color is half the pain. So I talked at length in my poem about line breaks, about how long you should pause after a line break versus a piece of punctuation. Here, I think it's worth noting that the pause, because the color is half the taste, it's a shame to eat blackberries in the dark. I think that that's a longer pause than you would have between stanza breaks or line breaks because it's a title. And so when you encounter a title, you expect to pause after the title. However, I also think the pause is probably a bit shorter than it would be if the title stood on its own, right? You get to the title because the color is half the taste and you get a sense that the sentence is going to continue. It starts with because it's obviously the first half of something more. So you're gonna pause, <laughs> in my opinion, I'm probably thinking about this more than I need to, probably longer than a stanza break, but shorter than a title that is a complete sentence. So that's just worth thinking about the role that this kind of pause plays versus a title that's complete. Often a good poem title is in conversation in some way with the content of the poem itself. Poem titles are pretty different, I think, than the title of a novel or a short story or an essay. This isn't a news headline. It doesn't have to accurately describe what you're going to experience. And it plays a more integral role in the reading experience because poems are short. So you're probably going to be thinking about the title in the back of your mind pretty much the entire time you read the poem, unless the poem is like 100 pages long or something. So let's talk about a poem where the title is clearly in conversation with the content of the poem. I got this from the Poetry Home Repair Manual, which I'm not very far into. I'm not crazy about it, it's okay, but it does have a very good example of a, of a title that's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Now there's a word in this poem that I understand to be a slur. So I am not gonna read it. Um, I wish I could have found a poem that has the same impact, the same title role, that doesn't involve a slur, but I couldn't. So I'm just not gonna read it, but please put them in the comments if you can think of a, of a poem that does something similar. This is called, And I Raised My Hand in Return. And I Raised My Hand in Return. Every morning for two weeks on my walk into the village, I would see the young goat on the grassy slope above the stream. It belonged to the who lived in the plaza below the castle. One day on my walk back to the mill house, I saw the little goat hanging from a tree by its hind legs and a, was pulling the skin off with a pair of flyers, which he waved to me in greeting. Okay, so once again, the final line kind of brings us full circle to the title. 
he waved to me in greeting with a pair of pliers, like pulling apart a goat. And I raised my hand in return. It's kind of an understatement. It's it's obvious that the person experiencing this is kind of freaked out by what he's seeing, but he just calmly waves. And you know, the title is doing a lot here. If we had a simpler title like the goat, I don't think this would be anywhere near as interesting. So this video was very much inspired by my work doing manuscript consulting and offering feedback on a poem a month for patrons. So. If that sounds good, if that sounds interesting, like something that you would like to do, you can join my Patreon, link in the description. I promise you won't find a cheaper way to get manuscript consulting or feedback on a single poem. That's pretty much a guarantee. I mean, let me know if you do find someone cheaper because I also would like to send my, my work for feedback.